welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Tom Fernelli. That's Bud Elliott. I'm Chip Patterson coming to you live at YouTube.com slash Cover 3 and everywhere you get your podcasts on demand. Thanks for hanging out. Smash that subscribe. Smash that like and come and join us in the chat, a.k.a. the Cover 3 tailgate. Rocking and rolling here on a Thursday where we get interactive. That means the Cover 3 tailgate's got questions for us. We've got some answers. And for those of you who have thrown a question in the big old bag of mail, well, hey, it's time to get to some of those as well, including what you see here on this headline. A question that, yeah, it's like, is it catnip for a college football podcast in early March? Yes, but it is a question that someone has asked, and it builds on a conversation that we've had in previous episodes that was only focused on the SEC. So coming up a little later, you asked, we'll answer, what are the top 10 jobs in college football? And elaborating on that a little bit, what factors go into your rankings? So all that coming up in a little bit. Danny, how's the mic? No. Oh, no. <laughs> oh man. DK. <laughs> All right, we're having microphone issues with Danny Cannell. I think he's going to jump in on the... Uh... What, what time do we think Danny's tea time actually is? <laughs> he says he has a oh, flight no. to Louisville. What I the hell would anybody time. ever be flying to Louisville for? I don't buy that for a second. He's going I'll golfing. take volleyball, volleyball as like the number one and then like like bourbon trail as, as a close second. Maybe both. Ooh, Danny Cannell as the next Louisville men's basketball coach. There we go. That's it. That is it. Uh, as Middlebrook always, and Middlebrooks with him. <laughs> another year of eligibility uh, for uh, for his nephew. Okay, so uh, we always like to reward here at the top of a mailbag show those of you who show up early and get the conversation going. And about two hours before we got started, Michael jumped into the tailgate, cracked one, and said, "Who wins in a game of risk, and who is the first to set up an alliance?" First of all, to, to, how many of us have played Risk and know the rules? I would say, I mean, I, I have played Risk. <laughs> I don't know that I know the specifics of the rules still, but Exactly, yeah. Uh, it's probably been at least a decade. Uh, I, I could probably figure it out at a certain point. But I would need to form an alliance because I don't know the rules. Yeah, right, I, I played a year ago. Okay. Okay. For now I wins. lost to my third grade nephew. I was teaching him how to play. So I don't know. I know how to play. I don't know if I would win, though. But also, my same nephew texted me yesterday asking me if I would come over and play Axes and Allies. And I said, sure. And I'm going to kick your ass this time. And he says, yeah, right. <laughs> so my, my third grade nephew is talking crap to me via text about board games. The, the level I never got to with Risk and have only learned since playing it often is that there are certain countries that you can essentially game the system with. In the same mm -hmm. way that in Tecmo Bowl, there were teams that were almost unfair, uh, that if you get certain countries, then based on you know where you are on the map and the resources you would be able to, to pull together, that you can almost be unbeatable. I was never those countries. I mean, I, I, I didn't have like a Washington Generals record in risk, <laughs> but I would say I was, a, I was an NIT team uh, when it came to, to risk. So I'd be looking to set up an alliance, Danny. Yeah, we're good. Yes! There we yes. go. go. He plugged really in his computer. He's going to pretend I'm... it was some sort of big problem. He's going to try. He didn't have it plugged in. I'm really embarrassed because we we did a lot of tech troubleshooting, and it was really a simple solution. That no, there's a tiny, tiny mute button on the microphone right there, <laughs> and sometimes if it's not the mute, so like Bud is Captain Mute, but it got <laughs> me this time. The little button that was not on the yeah, just whatever. I'm good. I'm ready to go. Yes, I do have to do a bit of catch because my daughter's travel volleyball schedule is like an NBA schedule. That's why we got back to backs. We got three and four. It's bananas. Oh. All right, so Danny, I'm I am not going to um, cast judgment, but uh, how, how what's our risk experience? Um, very little. Okay. Yes. So Tom wins. Bud and I set up alliances. Danny is first in, out. 
Yeah, first one out. Okay, yeah. so there we go. Again, that's a question from the tailgate. You jump in before we get the show started. You offer a fun one. Uh, we'll be sure to tackle it in the, a mailbag episode. On to some of the news of the day. As yesterday, it was made official. The early signing period will be moved to early December. We dealt with a few of these proposals that we've discussed on the show. So now that the, the news has broken, but I am curious, it, two things either way. Number one, what kind of feedback? You've heard either from like the coaching or evaluator or player personnel community. And then number two, even if you were to offer your own expertise, you know, what do you think the impact is in terms of does it change the trends that we have seen with the early signing period? So I, I don't think it'll change the trends that we've seen with the early signing period very much. Um, the couple coaches I texted with yesterday were like mostly in favor of it, that it's sort of a Band-Aid on a situation that we're just going to keep putting Band-Aids on until we get to a spot where we can actually like exchange some value for some control and have guys on contracts. Otherwise, it's just going to be a constant quote-unquote chaos, uh, although the sport continues to thrive. But for them, it is nice to get the high schoolers locked in earlier than ever, uh, for the most part, because then you can focus solely on transfers. And like if you are a school that doesn't take a lot of transfers, then you might get to have like a little more sense of normalcy around Christmas break, right? So getting the high schoolers out of the way, it's a nice way to present it as, hey, we care about high schoolers. Like we care about you high school coaches and high school recruiting. We're, we're not going to let all these transfers take your spots. We're going to let you guys have the first bite of the apple. Signing day will be before the portal even opens, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. So then the colleges can just focus on transfers thereafter. Um, I think it's mostly a minimal impact. I think if you're a coach at like a, a school that's playing for like a, a conference championship. So maybe 12 coaches, right? More than that, but, but not, not many that more. Uh, maybe you don't like it quite as much, but overall somewhat positive, I guess. Yeah. And I like, sorry, I like not the way to... you phrased that, whether intentional or not, because I do think it sums up recruiting right now in general, where you just said, get the high schoolers out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, all right, can we get these damn, whatever, let's just worry about these transfers. Well, I mean, I do think if you're building championships, you mm -hmm. better be doing it out of the high school level, okay? Like, I went on, on Grinding the Mocks, which is a cool thing. It, it's like an aggregation site of all the different mock drafts out there. 21 of your 25, your top 25 guys out there were high school signees who never transferred. And of the four who did, two guys were quarterbacks, Daniels and Williams, who left because their coach left. One got fired and one you know went to USC, followed him. One, Latu. Washington wouldn't clear him medically, so he had to transfer if he wanted to keep playing. And the other was Jared Verse, who was a more traditional, like we think of it, you know, transfer, he's mm -hmm. looking for a better spot, his coach didn't leave type thing. So if you want to get like the super elite players in the sport and you don't want to pay top dollar for them for all three years, you, you better be doing it through the high school level still. So I think high school still matters, but schools do hold some spots back. I think if you're doing it right, you're mostly high school still. And, and like you're going to miss in high school some. So you're filling in those gaps of your misses via the portal or you're making some select upgrades through the portal. There's uh, just sorry, didn't mean to not offer all the details uh, for those of you who don't listen to every single show. Obviously, everyone listens to every single show. But right now we have a early signing period that this past year was December 20th. It was on the third Wednesday in December. This new move is to the beginning of December, right after the conclusion of the regular season during conference championship week. It will be an early signing period of three days um, to, to be able to lock down your high school class. And as Bud said, get it out of the way. Danny, you have any uh, in, any big takeaways? I know we've, we sort of sniffed that it, this was going to be coming for a little bit, but you know now it's finally in place and, and it'll be in place for uh, this upcoming cycle. Yeah, um, not a huge... I mean, I, I don't know. This just doesn't move the needle much for me. You know, it's one of those topics that I think we have to address because it is different. And the coaches complain about various things. I think it definitely helps them enjoy some off time and get bowl practices in and do some other things after the regular season is over. So from that perspective, I think the coaches probably don't you think they'd love to do away with the early signing period altogether and go to February back to the way it was? No, because they don't want to babysit. That's the reason why why they moved it to December anyway, because coaches were bitching about having to, to like keep track of their commitments, you know, all, all the way to February. Yeah, you don't you don't want them to go home and all of a sudden start talking to family and friends and old high school, you know, like just you know yeah. 
all this all of a sudden it uh it gets a little bit dicey when you're having to to try to you know keep up with all that thing all all of that and maintain the relationship all the way through uh the holiday season so i just I'm, can't wait till the day it becomes national contract signing day the yeah. from the perspective of the way that we talk about it the way that we present it i do think it'll have more pop and i don't think that's a big deal for anybody but us yeah but to go from the end of the season and then you go through this little bit of a lull period and then we sort of like pop up after the first Saturday of bowl games. Oh yeah, recruiting. And then, you know, have to go through a little bit of a lull before the really big bowl games start up around the holiday time. You tack it on at the end of the regular season. It probably ties a little bit closer to the decisions to fire or not fire coaches. You know, like it, it, it is a little bit more of a, a part of that, the rhythm of the end of the season, rather than having to just sort of stick it in the middle of a no man's land in the middle of the bowl season. But that's only selfish. Also for us, I love it because at, at least last year, think about how many of these conference championship games we weren't really fired up for. Like M Ooh. Michigan, Iowa w was a predetermined result, basically. Like we, we knew who was going to win. We knew it wouldn't be pretty. We, we just weren't sure how ugly it would be. Oklahoma State, Texas was sort of a one-way game. Either Texas handles handles his business or it doesn't. You know, like the SC title game was a good one. We were really looking forward to the Pac-12, but like giving us something to talk about on that Wednesday before we previewed the games and did our locks on Thursday would have been nice. I think they're going to be much better though with no divisions. I mean, they could be totally yeah. that much better. Yeah. I just and, and getting Texas coaches, and Oklahoma out of the Big Twelve right. makes that league so much more equitable. Don't think for coaches though that are in those games, this is a major pain in the yes. neck. They have pushed back. Right. I have gotten that. Yeah. It depends on where you're at. I do think that if you are at a major, major school, you have enough analysts and stuff behind the scenes that you can handle most of that kind of stuff during the day, like while you're practicing, while you're prepping, all that kind of stuff. And then maybe you reserve an hour and, and your guy, like your director of high school relations three says, Hey, coach Danny, uh, we're all good on these guys. Send them a nice text. I need you to call these two just to make sure we're still good. Send them our love. Can't wait to get their paperwork on Wednesday. Like that, a lot of these guys have analysts who do a decent bit of the recruiting for for them at the very, very big programs. Now, if you're at like a, a, a Troy or you know an Ohio, that's not the case. Like that, that probably is where it's a major pain in the ass. Are you saying they catfish recruits? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, it would be a fun way to make conference championship games fun again. What? Like. If obviously with the current format, you'd get the buy if you win your conference. But if they go to the 14 and they do the thing where like the Big Ten and the SEC get three auto bids, you have two conference title games. You have one versus two to decide who your conference champion is. Then you have three versus four to decide who gets the third automatic bid. <laughs> That's what I, I like that idea because then Love you can still keep them relevant. Yeah, mm -hmm. I... I am very interested if we move forward with this, how they decide who gets the three, whether it's the committee that decides it or whether it's the conferences and they've got their own way to decide it. We'll see. Should be the conferences. Also I agree. Like let the let the conferences determine their own way to award their three automatic mm -hmm. bids. I would like to see a bottom four play in, right? In the SEC and like the winner of the, the bottom four bracket gets four million extra bucks you can use for NIL. <laughs> Think about it. Like right. Vandy, Mississippi State, South Carolina, and whoever else finishes in, in, in the bottom. Like like I mean, hey, would the kids care? Probably because it's like they're playing for, for some more NIL money. Now in in reality, if you finish in the bottom four, you're probably using that NIL money on some guys from outside the program to come in and help, but they don't know that. Like that let's right. let's have everybody in some sort of tournament. So let's say you're in tournament. 12 Right, you're, in 12th Turn, place. you're in 12th place in the Big Ten going into the final two weeks. Are you tanking those last two games so you can get into the bottom four tournament to try and get that NIL? If you're not on the hot seat, then yes. But if you're on the hot seat, you're like, your fans will really hate you because you actually won the game to finish, you know, five and seven and not four and eight. All right, bud, you, you stepped in it on this one because uh, also before we got going, uh, our friend Ryan jumped in the tailgate and said, mailbag, bud said something on Twitter about buying into South Carolina. What does that look like this year? A bowl game? Is Sean Elliott going to have an influence, and are they going to run it a lot? So what – I, I miss this, bud. You're buying in on the Gamecocks for 2024? I said, am I buying into South Carolina this year? Like, question mark? I, I, I'm i intrigued. I think we'll use that word. I'm intrigued by what South Carolina is doing. 
I think the defense could be better. Uh, they have a lot of nice size on the offensive line. I don't think people really I, – I think Lenora Sellers might be pretty good at quarterback, and they could be a, a heavy quarterback run team. If you look at some of the coaches they've brought in, like, that's some of the stuff they've done. You know, Sean Elliott, uh, I, I, I know – that Beamer said he was like their top choice. I don't know why you'd wait 30 days to hire your top choice, you know, and like the guy waits until day two of spring ball to leave. But regardless, he does have a lot of experience in a quarterback run system. They also took Robbie Ashford to be the backup. I I'm a big fan of marrying the style of play between your backup and your starter. So if you got a guy in seller, who's a big body guy who can, I would think at least five design carries per game with him, most likely plus a couple scrambles. That's some shots he might take. And you put that kind of beefy offensive line with a, a, a mobile quarterback. I would like to have a backup who could come in and do something similar if uh, if Sellers got dinged up. So, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, there's no rule that says South Carolina has to suck. Uh, I mean, you I, just I threw him in the bottom five, to, the $4 million bottom four tournament real fast. That's just history. I mean, like, South Carolina is a bottom four program in the SEC by any measure. Uh, but – I mean, like, there's no reason they have to get worse. They, they, I actually kind of like some of the stuff they've done in high school recruiting. They got crushed in the portal last year, but I mean, I don't know. I, I kind of I'm intrigued by the style. Right. I'm fired up for their third receiving coach since December. Mike Furry was hi hired since James Coley left. Well, Beaver said they upgraded, but I'll back him on that because he was my <laughs> wide receiver for the New York Giants, uh, not Giants, Dragons. Yeah. New York oh, Dragons. Whoa. Oh. Arena ball teammates. He's a really good dude. I'm happy for him because he's been he's been trying to break into the coaching ranks. He's been like very small. You know, I forget what school he was at, but he's been trying to break in. So it's a big opportunity for him. He's he's a really good dude. He had a nice NFL career too. Um, I think he's gonna really do a good job for Beamer. He's a good guy. So I'm what happy year, for him. What year were you on the Dragons? Two thousand two. Were the Cobras still in the league at that point? The Carolina Cobras? I don't think the Cobras were there. We played the Philadelphia Soul. Um, played the Barnstormers. Didn't John Bon Jovi own them? He owned the Soul. Yeah, him and yeah. Jaws. Jaws was an owner too. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It the, was a lot. It was a blast. Was Carolina. A Matt Nagy. Uh, Matt Nagy. Don't, don't, don't mention that guy. guy. Don't mention he was my. Uh, he was my backup quarterback. It's funny how Matt Nagy. And never mind. Yeah, uh, uh, it I won't insult the man on the show. Okay, okay. <laughs> no, I'm just saying Matt Nagy was a great offensive coordinator with the Chiefs. Went to the Bears, it didn't work, and then he went back to the Chiefs, and he's a great offensive coordinator again. It's like I, I wonder what the common denominator is in these three jobs. And Eric Bieniemy goes, he leaves, he can't. Yeah, you know, he's not uh -huh. a great offensive coordinator anymore. Huh. <laughs> wonder if like Patrick Mahomes is like an agent and gets five percent of every contract these guys sign. I would ask for it. Yeah. Um. Uh, right. Brady should have. We. Brady, sh wait, Tom Brady should have got the five percent for everybody that, that he helped. Same with Peyton Manning. Look at yeah. his crowd. Like Adam Gase got two head jobs after that. Imagine Tom Brady getting five percent of Charlie Weiss's buyout at Notre Dame. <laughs> Is Scott Leffler still claiming Tom Brady? I think so. Yeah. I would be. Yeah, if I even met the guy, I'd be like, "Yep, I coach Tom Brady." <laughs> Uh, real, we don't have to unless there's like a big this. This is one of those college football headlines that's good. Oh, you know, might might make your eyes pop out, but truly may or may not have a ton of significance. But when it you've got a rivalry like this, um, always notable. So Ole Miss has hired a new defensive analyst. It happens to be the former head coach of their Egg Bowl rival, as Zach Arnett, ousted by Mississippi State, is joining the Ole Miss staff as a defensive analyst. I always thought Zach Arnett was a pretty good coach. Mm -hmm. Um, still, still interesting. Uh, I, I listen. You're old Miss. You know the offense has been fine. You go in the transfer portal. What did you load up on in the transfer portal this year? Defense, because you realize our defense needs to be better if we're going to really compete in the SEC and try to you know get to the SEC title game, get to the playoff, all that stuff. Zach Arnett's a good defensive coordinator. He was a good defensive coordinator at Mississippi State. When you watch Mississippi State last year, the defense was still good. It's like, especially, I, I feel like up front, they do a good job of confusing teams. And I think that bringing that to Ole Miss will be valuable to them because you're not, Ole Miss isn't going to get where it wants to get if it just has to try to score 40 points per game. It's going to need to stop people on defense too. And I think this is a good move for them. 
I mean, he probably learned from his mentor. Nick Saban was always collecting coaches that he could learn from, glean any sort of information. So I think absolutely you pick his brain. I'm sure they have some sort of relationship, just recruiting in the same landscape, crossing each other's paths, being at SEC media days, like all of it. So it's like, hey, why not come come hang out with us, you know? Come to the SIP. Yeah. Any, anything you can do uh, when your chips are to the middle of the table like they are for the Rebels here in 2024. Coming up on the other side, the conversation started and will continue in terms of stacking up some of the best coaches in college football. But, but what about not just coaches? What about the jobs? What are the top 10 jobs in college football? What factors go into those rankings? Coming from the big old bag of mail. Next. CBS celebrates Women's History Month. Back here on the Cover 3 podcast, when you go and you leave us a five-star review, and in that review, you put a mailbag question, we'll tackle it in a future mailbag episode from the big old bag of mail. All right, this question comes in. Uh, headline, potentially fun, off-season mailbag question. Love the pod. Have rarely missed an episode since 2020. RIP Barton. Potentially fun, off-season mailbag question. As the never-ending coaching carousel carries on each off-season, it's often brought up that X job is better than Y job because of blank. Or, quote, this coach should wait a year and get a top 20 job. I'd be curious to know a cover three ranking of the top 10, 15, or 20 jobs in college football and what factors go into ranking each job. Again, love the pod. Keep up the great work, fellas. So when I'm in the um, in our doc, I uh, I did not include top 20. I don't think I don't I don't think we need to take it that far. That seems that seems excessive. Top 50 college football coaching head jobs. And remember that we are not saying this is not the coach rankings in May. We are going to be having a CBS sports coach rankings. We are going to talk about our ballots for the CBS sports coach rankings here on the cover three podcast. And that is going to be ranking individual coaches today. We are ranking jobs before we get into our lists. I'm curious about the second part of that question uh, from our listener. What, what factors go into it? What, what matters the most to you, Danny? in terms of trying to say what makes a job great resources. How, how can I get the best players in the game? You know, how, how can I attract the top players? It's one thing I really have come a long way on the last 15 years. I've been an analyst because I used to get annoyed by, Oh, like I would have been annoyed with Bud's blue chip ratio. I'm like, Oh, you're this is a great team game. This is a team sport. We can overcome that with you great like coaching and stuff back in the day. Right. Oh no. All right. <laughs> I would have definitely been like, wait, what are we doing? We can coach our way out of this. And Danny nope. was a, was the bluest of blue chips. He was like one of the best quarterback recruits <laughs> in the entire country. And he played with with nothing but absolute freaks on peak Bobby Bowden teams. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. But we agree great work ethic. Grit. And we, we grit worked our tails <laughs> off. <laughs> so you can achieve with great effort. But <laughs> over the years, I've seen the blue chip ratio be the most accurate thing in sports, I've come to realize the game is all about ta talent acquisition. So I would say like resources, how do you attract the best competition? And then it goes to facilities, which all ties into how do you get the best guys there? Fan support, same. Like they, they have to give to NIL program. So it basically it all boils down to what's who's going to give you the best support to build what you want to build. Who's going to pay me the most money? Okay. And whose fan base is going to donate the most money so they can keep paying me the most money. So give me the rich school with the crazy fans. Texas A&M is the number one job in the country. <laughs> you know, it, go ahead. But, but I mean, are you a resources, talent acquisition, recruiting footprint like those? Kind of. Yeah. I, I like money. Although most of most of the jobs that we would conceivably put on this list are sort of going to hit that like minimum. Right. Are, are you leaving one job where you where you make nine and a half to go make eleven? It maybe, but like there's there are other factors you care about too. So I would say like expectations of the job versus the ability to actually meet those expectations. Like, is this a place where they're gonna fire me after four years because they're just run by crazy people? 
I'd rather make like a million less per year, but have a place where I'm like, you know what, honey, we can raise our kids here in the same town for 10 years straight and, and give our family some semblance of like a normal life. And they'll grow up with kind of the same friends. Like that's, that doesn't happen often, but that's certainly the dream if you can achieve it. And so I do think having some understanding of what the expectations are and the ability to meet them uh, are, are really important in, in this gig. Alignment goes into that too. Like, I mean, I would have had Florida quite a bit higher on this list if we did it a decade ago than, than I do today. I wouldn't have them in my top 10 today. I don't, I don't think they have good alignment, you know, but uh, where am I going to live? Is a big thing. And that's just a preference where you like. Like some people might like the Pacific Northwest more, or they might like a big city or a college town. Do you care about how much can you go out to dinner in some of these places and not just be constantly hounded? You know, I, I'm not gonna put Kentucky in my top 10 list, but people talk about Lexington being a big enough place to where like Mark Stoops can go out to dinner and not just be like harassed. I don't know if Calipari can, uh, but Cal Perry can't leave his house without being harassed. Like Lincoln Riley can go to dinner in L.A., right? Kalen DeBoer can go to dinner in Seattle and not have not have people come up to him. Good not luck going to dinner in Tuscaloosa. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. So how big of a town is it? Like, do you care about where is it? Um, th those things sort of – and I don't think – I've got one thing that no one has specifically mentioned, and I did not have on my list, but I think it, a lot of traditional thinking would have it out there. And that is a winning tradition. LSU did not have a winning tradition for a long time. And then Nick Saban created a winning tradition. And LSU's on my list. LSU's on my list because they've got the recruiting footprint. LSU's on my list because of what we've laughed about, the old Barton story. You show up to the Louisiana State mm -hmm. Championships and every single high school is purple and gold or they're named the Tigers or both. Like It, it is an entire mindset of a talent-rich state to prepare the best football players to be in the mix to go to LSU. And I I don't think that you can look at pre-Saban and see a long winning tradition. In the same way, there are programs that have national championships on national championships from a bygone era that I do not have on my list of top 10 jobs right now. You can't just point to the trophy cases and think that that's automatically going to flip and be able to be instant success. Just ask Jim Harbaugh where it took him near a daggum decade to be able so, to get everything together. So no Minnesota, Nebraska on your list? No Minnesota, no Nebraska. You're right. You're spot on. Um, so combine that with all the other factors that we've got here, and at least those those contributed to you know my own sort of personal analysis, this snapshot of the top 10 jobs. I don't think there's any right answers, but I do think there are some potentially like wrong answers if you polled coaches. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like there's certain jobs where like, okay, like that's not a top – I'm not saying I know exactly where it should be placed, but like that's not a top four job. Are any of your top 10 outside of this Big Ten and SEC? Nope. Not right uh, now. It's not. Uh, 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 does it... Only one. Only one. Yeah. I had two. I mean, come on. ACC boys got to ride together. But they are 9 and 10. Yeah, right. And it's only because of the confidence that I have that, that these schools are going to get out of that league and fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like if Florida State gets in the Big Ten or the SEC, it jumps back into my top 10. But right now, not in my top 10. Mm, okay. Yeah. The so why is too many questions in Minnesota? Yeah. I mean, look. It, it, yeah. All right. So what's what's we'll start at the top. What's number one? Bud had me flip flop my one and two because of what he mentioned about where you live. Give me Texas. Give me Austin. Resources galore, winning tradition, money, deep deep pockets. You do have the redheaded uh, stepchild down the street in College Station, but I still think you get the better of them with recruits. <laughs> Give me Texas. I'm going Georgia. I had Georgia one. I flipped them to two. It's not that far from Atlanta. Like it is, Athens is a great college town. I have them too. Georgia, Athens, great college town, and Georgia has an LSU like. I mean, everyone comes into Georgia. There's yeah. uh, there is so much talent. Everybody's coming to Georgia. Uh, every SEC school is coming into Georgia. Clemson's coming into Georgia. Florida State's jumping up into Georgia. But you do have, like, you are the prominent flagship uh, football program of a talent-rich state. I've I've got Georgia as my number one. How many programs have had three different head coaches win national titles in the last 20 years? 
Ohio State is also the no, it's not the one. No, LSU. 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 LSU is oh. number one on my list. Because yeah. I mean, George is a great job. I mean, I, I was saying it was a top five job years ago before Kirby did, and back when people were like, "What the hell are you talking about?" But until Kirby showed up, a lot of good coaches didn't win national titles. So it's like, is that Georgia or is that more Kirby at this point? Will they still be able to maintain it after he's gone? We know LSU, you can win national titles with Ed Orgeron. You can win them with Les Miles. You can win them with that Saban guy. You could probably win them with Brian Kelly. We'll see. To me, that is the number one job in the country. And also, but Baton Rouge is a fun point, place to live. But to Bud's point, you can also get fired even if you did win a national championship. You're two seasons away from being shown you the door. You can. But Those guys were really incompetent at the end, though. I mean, like, yeah, agree. Like, <laughs> Les, Les got a really long leash before they finally let him go, and then Ed kind of did other things that got him let go. Let's a. Hey, what do hey, you think? Y'all remember that story from the gas station in that article? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Hey, what's that got to do with me? <laughs> I mean, I bet you if you asked Saban, he'd say LSU's a better job than Alabama. Yeah, I have LSU ahead of Alabama. Yeah, I do too. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I had Bama at three. I'll, I I'll go ahead and just say Ohio State to round it out because I, I really thought there were legitimately four answers that you could give for the best program in the country, like the, or the best job in the country. Mm -hmm. And we just named them all. Georgia, Texas, LSU, Ohio State in some order. I mean, you mm -hmm. have to be a really fantastically bad coach to not win at Ohio State. Ohio State is basically automatic wins. Like, like They're like Oklahoma on steroids as far as their results. Um, so... Where does Everybody Bama fall there. for you guys? And a lot of it, I would say, right now, like that's what I was saying when they did the search. I'm like, I don't, I don't think Bama is the desirable spot because you had to follow Saban. But in a vacuum, let's say in five years, whether it works or it doesn't with DeBoer, where does that, where does Bama fall? You're I had, right. I had them higher than LSU. I, I've got them behind the four schools we've mentioned. I think they are flirting between bottom of tier one and top of tier two, and they are much closer to Tennessee than any Alabama fan would like to admit. I'm not ready to go there. I I, no, I had them as as like my clear five. Okay, uh, just because I would I rather live in all those cities as well rather than Tuscaloosa, um, and I think the access to talent in all those cities is equal or better than it is in Tuscaloosa. You know, um, and I, I think it's a it the also the expectations and the ability to meet them aspect here plays really like you have to follow Nick Saban. So we're saying like, what are the best jobs right now? Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think you could have, I mean, Alabama has to be in the top 10, I think, but I think you can have it anywhere between five and 10, depending on your own kind of personal preference. Like for me personally, and this isn't knock on what you can do at Alabama, but I would rather have the Oregon job than Alabama simply because I would rather live in Eugene than in Tuscaloosa. And I think you can get the same kind of resources there. You know what I mean? Like Dan Lanning seems pretty happy in Eugene feels like he wants to be there for a while. I would probably be in that kind of similar path. So I have Oregon ahead of Alabama. All right. So what now we're getting into the second tier where it's a little bit crowded. Who's the who's the higher school, the school that you think you might be higher on than anybody else here in the, the bottom half of the top ten? I had Oregon pretty high. Oregon. Dang, I had Oregon at six. Yeah, I, I have Oregon too. at five. So I had him six. <laughs> None of us have him higher than we thought. So we're all oh, wrong. This on one, that though, one. Does this one you ignore where you have to live? Because Eugene is hard to get to. It's hard to recruit from, but you just have private jet use and you're able yeah, to. Yeah. How you often do you think Dan Lanning fl flies commercial? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Any Probably of these coaches not. at I, any of these schools aren't flying commercial. It, it's like I have Oregon at six, and that's like the highest I think I've ever had them. They're by far the highest team on here that's never won a title post World War II. But I really think that they have Phil Knight just going all in right now, like Mike Illich was when he got in his, you know, when he was 90 years old trying to run the Tigers. It's like, what's the luxury tax? Don't care. All right. We're just going to spend and spend and spend. And like they got embarrassed twice in a row by guys job hopping who are Florida natives, by the way, going back to FSU and going back to Miami. And they're like, we're not going to have it happen a third time. Like, let's keep in mind here Oregon kept Dan Lanning. I know the Chris Lowe article and whatever that was uh, about you know, not being interested. Yeah, right. Like you, you'd rather have. Okay, yeah. I, I think Oregon did what they needed to do to keep Dale Lanning, and that shows a tremendous level of commitment. And also, the expectations there are reasonable. Mm -hmm. That's when you were talking about the like. I was thinking that a place like Oregon or a place like Penn State that I've got in my top ten. Yeah, comes also down to. 
Like, I, I, Texas a and not in my top 10. Texas A&M has resources. Texas A&M has talent in state that a Penn State or Oregon do not have. But if we're talking about the job, you it does seem like you have a different or more manageable set of expectations based on your resources at a place like Oregon or Penn State than you do at Texas A&M. Totally. Mm -hmm. I would also say, Chip, based on your view of Alabama and Tennessee jobs, I would say Tennessee is the job you're hired on than most everybody else. Oh, I don't have Tennessee in my top 10. I was just using oh, their okay. rival as like an example. I mean, I've got, I just mentioned I got Penn State at number eight. I've got Oklahoma at number seven. Did Oklahoma make y'all's top 10? I had Oklahoma at eight. Fringe. I, I, had, a, I had a really hard time numerically ordering these Same. ones we got past six. Yeah. I have mid 10, but it's not. I have heard, um, and, and like Brent, you know, hit me up. I'd love to come out and, and pay you a visit in person. I know he's a big fan of the Cover 3 podcast, but um, I have heard that it is surprising how strong just sort of the operation is around Oklahoma football. That just the, the infrastructure, um, it's it's tight. You know, like we talk about alignment. We talk about making sure that things don't fall through the cracks, that you don't book a hotel for an away game that's an hour and a half away from the stadium. You know, like de details, you know, like being able to – to really have a well-running operation, I think that Oklahoma is a place that we know the commitment is there. The on-field results definitely speak to it. And even though Oklahoma individually in the Big 12 definitely have not been pumping out loads and loads of NFL draft talent like other conferences, and they they just seem to be able to get it done on Saturdays in the fall. I I don't think it's an anybody can win there like an LSU, but I do think that right now it is set up in a way where it's one of the 10 best jobs in college football. Do you think you would be buying high? On Oklahoma? Oklahoma? Cause you're about to hit the sec and about to have a huge reality check. Yeah. That's the only thing that would concern me. I'd want to see it first. You know, that's fair. Definitely. I mean, I don't know that Oklahoma is going in with unrealistic expectations, right? Their, their win total in, at FanDuel is seven and a half. Mm -hmm. um, now, maybe OU fans think that's laughable, and, and perhaps it is. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think it's, again, I, I really think there are like 15 jobs you can argue for 10 spots. Mm -hmm. I, I was able to do kind of one through four, toss it up in the air. I think Bama, Oregon, for me, needed to be five, six in some order. And then seven through 15 is really, how, like, where do you want to live? OK, if you want to put a Florida State or a Clemson or a Notre Dame in the top 10, how confident are you that they're going to join a conference in relatively short order? Because if you're not one. confident that Florida State or Clemson get out, then you can't have them in the top 10 because we're very quickly going to be paying out of conference revenues. And then those schools are nuked if, if right. they you know are, are not out of these leagues. Because all of a sudden, Bandy's going to have a 4X payroll of, of Clemson. So yeah, that's just like because yeah. when Florida State and Clemson do join a new league, they're probably not going to be getting full shares. So it's Correct. like there's going to be a gap there where they're going to be a little bit behind. You got to play catch up. So unless they that, create a bidding war between the yes. two the two leagues, which I think is probably unlikely to happen because the two leagues seem to be colluding together with their working order and are probably going to merge at some point. If I had to guess, so why would two businesses that are probably going to become one business at some point mm -hmm. compete you know, with one another for a school? So I agree yeah, with like, you. I think they will probably not get full shares. Yeah, like in a vacuum, FSU is a top ten job, and I don't really think there's a whole lot of debate about it it's just in the current environment too many questions uh penn state anybody else because i did not have Penn State. i have just outside the top 10 just outside mine yeah eight um i i feel like they've got proper expectations so much passion like that you've got full support of being able to go and get it done i mean we people him and haw about james franklin not winning the big one but he's still there like he's yeah and he makes he, what 10 million a year, he, million he, a year like that. yeah I, I think that's a i think that's a pretty but good they're one kind of like oklahoma i worry about where they're going to fall in the pecking order with the four new teams coming and that could impact all of a sudden that perception of them being right there behind ohio state michigan what if it's you're right there behind ohio state michigan oregon usc you know what if all of a sudden that gets a little bit more painful i don't have usc i didn't either i don't either, either right now what about Miami? Did you have them even think about them? Because I saw some people no, putting that. Not, I not without a stadium. Yeah. I'm not, yeah. I'm not a Florida guy. By the yet. way, did you see Kitchens on uh, at the draft, the combine? 
see him mm-hmm. run the 4-6 or, or something else? <laughs> no, talking about the stadium he'd rather play in. I think he said he'd rather play in his old high school stadium than in Hard Rock. <laughs> he said it was a better atmosphere. I mean, it was it was, it was. was hey, bad. let's just do it all at Drive Pink or whatever, like, the new name of it is. You know, just yeah. just, just go ahead and, and fill up the house that Messi built. Um, Tom, do you have it? I've got Notre Dame on my list at 10. I've got Michigan I, in mine. I don't know if you guys have Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You have uh, Michigan top ten? Yeah. Yes. I don't have Notre Dame top ten. Oh, let's leave. All right. So mm-hmm. Andrew in the tailgate says not having USC is insane. Let's let's dig in. If all four of us are in agreement, I mean, it, very good. I've got it on my list. I just didn't put a number beside it. Right. So clearly, it was yeah. one of the fifteen that came to mind. Um, living in Los Angeles. Yeah. <laughs> Some people might, hey, I mean, I could live in Lincoln's house. I've seen pictures. I think I would be okay there with the, you know, 10 bedrooms on the Pacific Ocean having those sunsets. Would you be okay That's with fair. those taxes, though? <laughs> that would yeah. be a problem. Yeah, Danny, would you? <laughs> <laughs> Living in Los Angeles, trying to convince your, like, hardworking analysts to come live, mm-hmm. like, two hours of traffic away from the facility because it's all they can afford on the salary that you're going to be paying them. Um, You are operating in this position where you are treated like a pro team, but you don't totally have like all that sort of momentum behind you. You have a few wealthy donors. Never forget USC is a private school, but it's not like you just have those like masses and there ain't no Ipte going on. Uh, with with USC football and own the state of California though, which is a lot of talent. Yeah, you know? earthquakes, drought, wildfires, mudslides. It's just I, a fantastic I'll go game place day to atmosphere be. is a yeah. problem. Yeah, but when they're winning, the game day atmosphere is great. But they have to the be back to the like I. When, when have we seen the Coliseum rocking recently? And I think great for them is relative. Like, I think it can get pretty good, but I don't think it's anywhere close to a top 15 atmosphere. Yeah, the drop-off is enormous when it's not good. Right. Yeah, but that's that's the thing. That's the thing about the L.A. market. Like, it's all celebrity entertainment-based. You have to be a celebrity to draw the fans. So USC has to be winning. Like, during the Carroll Dynasty era, Snoop Dogg, Will Ferrell, all the local big hot celebrities at the time are always at all the games because it's the place you want to be seen. So that's the case with USC. You have to be winning. Michigan was still packing half time. Out. Michigan was packing out the big house, even though Plaxico Burris was calling for Jim Harbaugh to be fired. Right? <laughs> like, I mean, the 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 like community that pours out for Michigan football is why I would give Michigan football the edge over a place like USC. Mm-hmm. And alignment. Yeah. Are, are we sure USC is like that aligned? Uh, no, it's, it's been a mess. Like in Riley is. Yeah, I, I don't know, man. I'm, I'm not. Uh, I have somewhat downgraded my opinion of USC over, over the last few years in, in the NIL era, and I did not think I was going to. Yeah. So, did uh, Clemson's won multiple titles in the last decade. Did we not see them as a top job? No. See, I had Florida State and Clemson 9 and 10, but it's kind of subjective. I mean, it's very biased, clearly, but it also is – figuring in that they'll get out of the ACC. They'll be in a better position in five years. Uh-oh. I think Dabo Sweeney has made Clemson like, look like a better job. And so has Deshaun Watson and Trevor Lawrence and like a fever dream run of six straight college football playoff appearances. And, you know, the last couple of years have been a little bit closer to what Clemson aren't they is. a version of Oklahoma? Like if they get to the – aren't they like – kind of a similar program oh oklahoma's got way sustained generational success at the highest level tend to agree um where were we i think i would have four in a much higher number of game what good tom no he was talking about the mega church (laughs) oh (laughs) i i mean hey like like hope springs eternal right um (laughs) I think I would have UF much higher in like two years. A and M is also a program that I think you would really consider a top ten job in uh, in two years. Like if Elko is able to get in there and just be like, you know what? There's no mystique about this place that you can't win, even though 100 years of history says there's something that nobody can figure out. 
you know, with Florida, like I think their new president really cares about sports quite a bit. So like I would be very surprised if they don't have new leadership and more alignment in a couple of years with new coach, new AD, that kind of stuff. Uh, so I could see them jumping up. But right now I don't have I don't have either of those places in my top 10. Maybe I should. See, I, I know I said earlier like AM would be my number one because they'll pay me a ton and the fans will give you a ton of money, but like they're not in my top 10 simply because of the expectations of the fan base that come with that job. Whereas it's like they they get pissed off if you're not winning a national title when there's really nothing to show that, hey, that should be the expectation. It's like, no, we got to get there first before you can expect me to do it every year. Any other schools that we have not mentioned? All right. My list that I, I had, this is 15 schools for 10 spots. OU, Texas, Oregon, USC, Penn State, Michigan. This is not in order. Michigan, Notre Dame, Clemson, Florida State, Ohio State, Florida, AM, Bama, LSU, UGA. I think we hit them all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, who did we not hit that the chat thinks we should have had? Um Nebraska? Some no. people might think. I would I didn't have them in my top ten. But and that's the other thing is like, yeah, it, you can mention good jobs, mm -hmm. but we're talking about top ten. How what what's your proximity to the best jobs? So Oh, wait, hold on, Bud, did you not have Notre Dame on your 15? No, I did. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. Um, Auburn's probably the one that I think people would say. They, they, they've won a title in, in, in our lifetime. They've played for, I believe, what, two more? Uh, so They're there with Tennessee, that. aren't they? Kind of Tennessee-Auburn? I think Tennessee's a better job than Auburn. I mean, if you want to coach at a Banana Republic, sure, you could throw Auburn in your top 10. I... I think Tennessee is currently more stable than Auburn is from a like an yes. alignment who I'm working for type perspective. I mean, yeah. let's think about what I'd Tennessee I'd try to work for Danny White. Like Tennessee has successfully uh called an investigation on their own coach to get him out of there so they could hire a better coach. They have successfully put together one of the best NIL operations in college football. But a coach we that should have never ever been fired. Like one of th that'll go down as maybe like the worst coaching search in the history of this sport. What the one that ends up with Jeremy Pru? Oh, he yes. should have been hired, is what you said. Correct. Yeah, should have okay. never ever been hired. So, like, I get that they pulled some real gangster stuff to get him out and kind of like, you know, like, eh, hey, 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 look at our violations. Me, I'm not intimidated by it. it. Shows you can get things done. You know, if I need something <laughs> yeah. to be fixed on the other side, you know, I I at least know you've got weapons at your disposal. Um. All right. <clears throat> Coming up on the other side, we continue with your questions. We'll turn it on over to the tailgate, including we got some more nominations for our three players, one school, and should Florida State actually consider staying in the ACC? We'll get into that and more next. Blackout mystery. Welcome to March Stream March Madness live on any device, anywhere, and be ready for anything. Back here on the Cover 3 podcast, we love hearing from the tailgate. I think we answered this. Austin says, when Oregon hired Dan Lanning, you guys did a ranking of jobs and had Oregon as a top 15, 20 job. How would you rank them now? Clearly, as they're going to the Big Ten, we've all got them in the top 10. With like five. With, yeah, Tom's got them five. I've got them six or seven. I've got Oregon six. Because the spending, yeah. they have mm -hmm. totally upped their commitment level. 100%. Also, and Chip, multiple guys back won there. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the difference, okay? Like, Mark Helfrich even won a lot of games there. Taggart won there. Mario won there. Chip Kelly won there. Bellotti won there. The, Oregon is a place you can win. Now, they have not won a ring yet, but they have consistently been, like, you know, top 20, top 15, top 10. Yeah. And their fans aren't insane. So you can you could raise your family there for a while if you want to, as Lanning mm -hmm. intends to, apparently. Yeah, just keep watching the the um, the Born Identity movies with his sons while he's being um, told that his <laughs> private jet is in Tuscaloosa. <laughs> great. Um, let's see. I, we can do this one. Just great suggestion here. Uh, Chris from the tailgate, he wants to jump in. We A couple mailbags ago, we said quarterback, running back, wide receiver, all have to be from the same school, could be from any generation, try to put together the best possible. This suggestion is Louisville, where you have Lamar Jackson, Michael Bush, and Dion Branch. Uh, Super Bowl MVP sounds pretty good. Please discuss. Louisville's strong. No one's ever said Louisville's not a 
doesn't have a, a good say in a lot of Blue these. Like, they're a solid seven and five team in our super trio league. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's Lamar, and then it's like the other two Michael were like Bush and Deion Branch. Players. Yeah. yeah like <laughs> My, Michael Bush, Deion Branch don't measure up to me. Well, com compared to when we were throwing out like Danny Cannell, Warwick Dunn, Peter Warwick. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, that's that that is absolutely smoking that that uh, trio there. How, how about this one from Ian? Do you think that the expanded playoff will lead to longer or shorter coaching tenures? Making the college football playoff is easier and might buy coaches more time and goodwill. But winning a title is a lot harder. I think all coaching tenures will become shorter regardless of the size of the playoff. I think the money involved means people don't have to be lifers anymore. And you're already kind of seeing that. I think all situations controlled for, it will lengthen coaching tenures. Because um, you'll be able to keep selling the hope. Like, hey, yeah, I, I think four, like four is a uniquely exclusionary and bad number that was created solely to keep the payola coming from the bowl games. Like four was never a good number to have. Um, whether yeah. you're anti-expansionist or pro-expansionist, like, I think everybody with a brain would agree two was better than four. But right? these millennials and Gen Zers are so lazy. Right. So they're just so, going to want to be like, quit by the time they're 45 and go like travel the earth and find themselves. Tom, I'm approaching this differently. I'm thinking about hot seats. Like our coaching yeah, tenure is going to be longer or shorter. Not like, hey, I'm going to make all this money and then just say peace just because I can. I, I was thinking more about the, the more about the position of the third best team in the SEC or the Big Ten. And that if you are making it to the playoff, you maybe are receiving more goodwill from your fan base than if you were playing in the Outback Bowl. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I also think, like, the worst thing as an AD is when you're going to your luxury suites to talk to some of your big boosters about, about like, the future, and they're not there. And you have to end up calling them. Like, that's a bad sign. You want those luxury suites to be filled with your boosters. Like, those are kind of who you answer to as the AD in some cases. The 12 team playoff will have more games mattering down the stretch. I think it, it, you will have fewer examples where like the stadium's just empty with a month to go, as we did see a lot in the 14 era. So that's sort of one of the positives. Like, will some games have less meaning? Undoubtedly. Yes. We will have more games that have greater meaning, though. And I think. If you're playing in quote unquote meaningful games, that means you're at least doing well enough to be playing in those games. So you probably are less hot seated. I also don't know, like we talked about this yesterday. I, I mean, are we going to be having huge buyouts anymore? Probably for a little while at least. Long and I was, I, I was thinking that anecdotally, coaches have been getting fired earlier over the last decade. Yeah. That we have seen quicker triggers, less patience. And it, I mean, this has come at the same time that I've, grown to become an appreciator of um you know european soccer where like i mean tom you get guys get fired all the time mm -hmm. you, know, you have three different managers in a in a season i mean it's it is uh an incredibly quick trigger i uh my my thought is i think the playoff and i've mentioned this before i've talked about it there's going to be playoff fatigue like at first hey we've made the playoff three times in five years that's awesome but unless you're winning in the playoff, eventually getting to the playoff isn't going to be nearly enough for the fans. And it's, I think, psychologically, like, you have to consider the impact of, for everybody but one school, pretty much, their season ends with a loss every year. Mm -hmm. And that, psychologically, that has an impact. Like, if you're ending losing by, you know, even in the close games, you're going to the playoff, but you're losing year in and year out. Recency bias, our brains, that we're not that smart. Our attention spans and memories keep getting shorter. The only thing fans are going to remember is we lost that game. We've lost the game. We've lost the last game. And it's going to be, we, this guy's got to go. We got to get somebody who can win that game. Yeah, I, I could definitely see that uh, as well. Um, Andrew in the tailgate says, has the Hugh Freeze Auburn hire aged well? The best selling point was that he knew how to beat Saban. Saban's gone, and now DeBoer runs a better offense. Also, how did he not bring in a better quarterback? It has not aged well so far. Um, it's not worth punting on yet. They did recruit the high school levels extremely well. The quarterback thing, I think, is incomplete. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think two things are true. One, 
they like Peyton Thorne better than I do, just from the, the word that I got from over there. It's everybody. Two, the spring window is still about to be open. We, we, we should not close the book on Auburn signing a quarterback for the 2024 season until that spring window has closed. So let's just keep an eye on that. They had some, uh, I believe, HR stuff where their hands were tied with some of that staff turnover. So I don't know if Hugh Freeze would have made those moves. I think he's taken over play calling, uh, which, whatever. Um, I thought he wasn't. I thought that was the whole Derek Nick saga. Or maybe he is or isn't. Or, yeah, or, I thought but, that was Lane yeah. Clifton announcing the Auburn offensive coordinator hire on Twitter, saying congrats to the new do, play caller. Do you think they regret choosing Hugh Freeze over Lane when Lane very clearly wanted the job last year? I don't know. Not yet. I, I I think it's too early to know. Like, it's been a season. Agreed. And like you said, they've recruited well. I won't be shocked at all if they get a quarterback in the portal this spring, and then we'll see how it goes in the future. Like, I was never super high on the hire to begin with, but I'm not going to make a judgment on it after one season. Yeah, I'm, I would have rather had Lane, but I am applying some of my own personal biases there. I don't. I don't know if Hugh Freeze is a. Yeah, I, I, I think I would rather have Kiffin. All things considered, but but it, it, it's again it goes back to expectations. Like the expectation at Ole Miss is not to win a national title and has never been so. The expectation at Auburn is to like beat Alabama, and play for the whole thing. So, like, is Kiffin's skill set suitable for that? Fair, fair. I mean. Great thing about Auburn is if you don't do it, they got a booster coup waiting for you. I mean, they they know exactly how the to put together. The, they got they know how to put together the booster coup stew, baby. They got all the ingredients. Uh, all right, so let's see. And I will then, say for Kiffin, um, they went and hired like a a GM GM. So Billy over there is like a considered to be like a big time GM. So Ole Miss might be stepping up its recruiting operation a little bit. Well Kiffin like, had like Lane is not known as a good recruiter or like a, like somebody who like is a high a dogged recruiter. recruiter. Yeah. yeah he's not dogged certainly and I think he he would probably admit that. And he's also not known as somebody who like you know real he's he's certainly not a crystal ball in terms of how hard he rides his staff to get the most out of them in recruiting. But the fact that he has made some recent hires I think could could indicate a shift in that. We will see. I'll tell you what, he spends all of his time riding Hugh Freeze, trolling him on Twitter. That's true. <laughs> um, I uh all right, this one from Jerry. Uh Jerry says, should Florida State consider staying in the ACC if the conference is guaranteed two spots? They would be in the top two of the ACC more often than the top three in either of the power two. And when that deal expires, the exit cost is lower. No. Okay. Because very quickly, Florida State and everybody else in the college sports world anticipates that players are going to be employees and are going to have revenue sharing out of the TV revenue. That means that like Vanderbilt in 10 years is going to have three or four X the TV revenue of Florida State if they were to re remain in the ACC, which means your program from a competitive standpoint is dead as far as competing on the national stage, which is an expectation of a couple, not many programs in the ACC. If you want to compete for players, you're going to need the top dollar. So, you know, if you are, I don't know, Pitt or NC State or somebody, like you should probably stay. Like you're, you're the, that's more about the regional rivalries. If you're a program that camaraderie sells, and building for a better tomorrow. Yeah, like if part of your pitch though is we're trying to play for the whole the whole big prize, then you need to align yourself with the revenue that would allow you to pursue that big prize. I'm just trying to prepare these men to be leaders. That's what we're trying to do, bud. Come on. Hey, so. You you Leaders and legends. We're about to be there, man. <laughs> is Florida State more of a leader or a legend? If, if that's that's to be determined. We got to oh, see. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, no, no. That has been determined. Okay. <laughs> legend. All right. Because a legend can be good or bad. This thing, like a legend <laughs> can be crab legs. Okay. Like a legend can be uh, all, all sorts of, of ways you could look at being legendary. <laughs> You know, you think about like somebody tells like a really sweet story from back in the day. Say, bro was a legend. Does not mean he was a leader. Sure. But he was a legend. <laughs> uh, but you, 
you had some thoughts because you mentioned that Chris Lowe article um, before, like right before we got going yesterday, and I saw like more was being made of it. The you you think that it was sort of the story was told a certain way in terms of the the Sark and the landing side of this because I, you had a good point about if Greg Byrne is looking at Norvell and DeBoer, then you're looking for ball coaches, right? Um, what would you make of the the other pieces of that? I, I thought Saban's comments were were sort of interesting. Um, and I'll give Nick props for this. Like he's complaining about how the players are acting and how they talk about wanting to find playing time and uh, and, and their NIL deals. I, I, I give Saban props for for realizing like if he can't coach in that era, getting out as opposed to just staying around and, and bitching and moaning about it. You know, other coaches I think should do the same. Um, you know, I, the, like Kiffin and Dillingham seem to have it right. Like this is the system's evolving. Unless we're retiring soon, we better kind of change with the times and, and find a way to win in this market. I mean, Saban's genius was that he he exploited rules to the to the max to the fact that they had to create new rules many times. And uh it seemed like this was the one he just either couldn't or didn't want to deal with. And you know, maybe uh like maybe he realized, oh shoot, I should have spent been spending more time drumming up money for the collective over the past couple of years because I'm no longer getting that Nick Saban discount when it comes to the you know to the uh to the players. Mm. Yeah, so you're they, on that shut up and coach train. Kind of, yeah. I mean, I mean, for that kind of money, yes. That's what the money is for. You're not allowed to have an opinion. I need to put that on the soundboard, right actually, especially with everything that we're going to be having. Oh yes, get, going on. Get, Dra get Draper on here. Yeah, we'll get we'll get Draper on the uh, <laughs> on the soundboard. I uh, I've got a spot open right next to. <laughs> you know, just anytime you just need to get the blood pumping. <laughs> we'll have our own uh we'll, we'll do the bracket march madness style the monday after selection sunday playing it out if as if they were college football teams watch out watch out for those juggernauts the villanova villanova's not gonna make it they lost last night we'll see Villanova stinks we will be back on monday as you have seen uh we've got just like little bits of trickles and news and takeaways for as some of the biggest programs in the country get rolling with sprig practice uh jackson says inner sandman should be on there too okay actually i think is, is there a faster copyright strike you, you can receive than, than metallica well is i think that it is so far off from the actual oh, ship's entertainment, yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that it's actually I'm going to Lane Stadium. Boom, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> it's so bad oh, that there's no way I could get copyright. Terrible. Yeah, there you go. All right, <clears throat> we'll be back on Monday with more takeaways from across the country and so much more. And you can follow him on Twitter at Tom Fidel. You can follow him at Bud Elliott 3. You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you.